Cave Children On November 22nd, a rescue party led by Dr. Marcin Incieda into the Dorth Orel Caves of Pompeii discovered a damaged tape recorder tied to a piece of white guideline. In none of the four excursions were the missing parties in question found, nor any of their supplies save for the length of the guideline and the tape recorder attached to it. It serves as the only record of the events which the parties in question experienced. Seventeen entries of substantial length were recorded, as well as several shorter entries that appear to have been recorded by mistake, as no speech is audible for their duration. What follows is a transcription of the audio which appears in those seventeen entries. This is Dr. Mason Perry, September 12th, 1996, aircraft over the Pacific Ocean, 4.41pm Pacific Standard Time. In the Dorth Aral Caves of the small Micronesian state of Pompeii, there is a species of lizard with one of the most remarkable defense mechanisms known among reptiles. It has developed the ability to hurl rocks from the cave floor from where it dwells, with lethal velocity at targets at dozens of feet overhead. Nobody is quite sure why it has developed this ability, as the few current specimens currently available were found wandering around the outside of their natural cavernous habitats. My colleagues and I are travelling to Pompeii to study the lizard in its natural habitat, on the first trip of its kind, to attempt to discover the purpose for which this unique behaviour had been adapted. The reason no such expedition has been attempted, despite knowledge of the lizard's existence within the scientific immunity for some sixty-odd years, are various local reports of the danger of the caves. The folklore of the indigenous Tanichin people, natives to the area for thousands of years, tell that the progeny of the earth demon Bandulth dwell within the caves, guarding the entrance to his subterranean kingdom. These demon children are said to slay any who attempt to make passage through the caves, which were sealed off until roughly a thousand years ago, when the heavy rocks which covered the mouth of the cave's range were moved to construct ancient buildings by foolish men. Folklore is simply folklore, of course. The Tanichin are not an isolated tribe. They are perfectly modern people and seldom take old myths and legends of their culture as literal fact. However, on the two separate occasions within the last 70 years, young men have set out into the caves to prove their bravery and return with terrifying tales. Tales of having seen creatures exactly like those described in the old legends. They told of large four-legged animals with pale, translucent skin, characteristic of cave albinism. These creatures had severely arched backs, from each of the four corners of which protruded spindly limbs, bisected by single outward-facing joints, and at the bottom tips of which were flat feet. They lumbered about like awkward spiders with a wriggling left-to-right motion of their bodies, which appeared flexible. They had two large, immobile protrusions on their backs which were thought to conceal wings, though they were never seen to fly. Jutting out from between their two front legs was a round head with a single, enormous red eye which blinked rapidly. Both young men, having seen them only at a great distance from the safety of high above, described them as living in a group of perhaps thirty or forty constantly murmuring in a low buzz. When this group spotted the young intruders, they suddenly let out a high-pitched shriek, which, in both cases, frightened off their visitors. The latter young man claims that he was initially immobilized with utter terror, and was unable to summon the strength to run, only after they darted towards him with terrifying speed. Because of these sightings, Belief in the children of Bandorth has persisted among the Tanichin, and they refuse to go into the caves. My colleagues and I suspect that what the young men believe they experienced was heavily coloured by the local legends. However, we appreciate that some sort of large crustacean may live within the caves all the same, and as such have taken certain safety precautions. We brought binoculars with night vision capabilities so that we can make our observations at a safe distance from any of the cave life, and without the need for the artificial light source which might alert it to our presence. 
To the latter end, I am also taking research notes verbally with this dictaphone, to avoid the need for a light by which to write, should our headlamps need to be turned off. Because no guides for the caves exist, we have brought several thousand feet of highly durable cord with which to mark our path as we traverse the caves. Each of the four of us also has semi-automatic handguns with 15 rounds. Hopefully, we won't have to use these. This is Dr. Mason Perry, September 14th, 1996. Mouth of the Dulth Aral Minor, 3.18am Greenwich Mean Time, plus 11 hours. We are preparing our descent in the Dulth Aral Minor, the smaller of the two largest caves in the Dulth Aral Range. We would have preferred to select another cave than the one in which the children of Bandorth had been purportedly sighted, but this was the only one of the six caves in the range that the local Tanichin guides were able or willing to lead us. We have suited up with all the necessary gear for a scientific spelunking adventure, including a three-day supply of water and food. Our aim is to remain in the caves for a maximum of 18 hours on this trip. If it should happen we need more time to find the rocktail lizard on a single expedition, we will return better prepared for a longer stay. Still, one can never be too cautious. I am joined on this trip by Drs. Jeanette Briggs and William Kincaid. Dr. Marcin in Sierra fell ill after ignoring our group's admonitions and sampling a rather exotic local dish upon landing, and so will not be joining us on this initial expedition. He's going to miss all the fun! Should it happen that we do discover a new species of crustacean within these caves, we will make informal notes for the benefit of our colleagues back in the States. Okay, Mason. Line's tied off. Time to go. This is Dr. Mason Perry, September 14th, 1996, inside the Dolph Arrow Minor, 4.36am, Greenwich Mean Time plus 11 hours. I am currently watching a mature rocktail lizard specimen lift and sort rocks. When the lizard lifts a rock, he will turn it over several times in his prehensile tail, then set it back to where he found it. If he comes upon a floor in the rock, he tosses it up and out of the way of the cave floor. It seems as though the lizard spends some amount of its spare time, goodness that one was close, making sure that the rock supply is more usable in the event of an emergency. Look, Mason, a bat just flew under the ceiling. Whoa, did you see that? Jesus, that was fucking fast. The lizard picked up a rock, and then the bat fell off the ceiling. It, it happened so fast, I didn't even see it throw. The lizard is currently eating the bat it just killed. You know, Jeanette, we thought this was a self-defense mechanism, but it looks like a hunting behavior. Holy shit, holy shit, what was that? Jesus, Mason, did you see it? The lizard was trying to hit it. I think it scared it off. Dr. Mason Perry, September 14th, 1996, inside Dolph Aral Minor, 4.45 a.m. Dr. Briggs saw one of the children. We now suspect that it is an arachnid, or possibly some sort of insect rather than a crustacean. It was climbing on the ceiling when it appeared. We didn't notice it, but the rock-tailed lizard sure did. It whipped a series of rocks up at it at shocking speed. Dr. Briggs was the only one of the three of us who followed the trajectory of the rocks quickly enough to catch a glimpse of it. According to Dr. Briggs, it was probably close to five feet in total length, and stood perhaps two feet high. She didn't get a good look at the creature, but she did confirm a single blinking red eye in the center of its head. I'm not sure about this, Mason. You didn't see what I saw. I don't want to be near that thing. I see we head back. Dr. Briggs is shook up about the whole thing. Dr. Kincaid and I, however, are anxious to press on. Perhaps it's just because we want to get a good look at these children for ourselves. The young men who visited these caves reported that they spent approximately an hour wandering inside them when they discovered the nest. So, given the time spent observing the first rocktail lizard specimen, I figure it's maybe 20 more minutes into the cave until we see it. Dr. Kincaid has been trying to assuage Dr. Briggs' fears, 
by noting that we are entirely safe, high off the ground, and unlike the young men who visited before us, we will be armed. Stop talking your damn tape for a second. Don't you fucking narrate over me. I want to head back. That thing was fucking fast, do you understand? You saw how fast that lizard threw rocks. And it got out of the way of all of them. These things are quick when they want to be, Mason. I don't want to find out what happens when they see us. Okay, Janet, how about this? Would it make you feel better if we use the night vision from here on in? That way, they won't be able to see us, and you've got nothing to worry about. Janet, you've seen animals on expeditions that we know can kill humans easily. What's the first thing you learn about those animals? What did you say the whole way here? That if you leave them alone and stay out of their way, they won't bother you. Exactly. Look, Janet, these things are cave spiders, right? Cave spiders aren't aggressive creatures. If we leave them be and we stay out of their way, and they can't even see us, we'll be fine. I guess... Okay, I'll go. But I want this to go on record, on that little record you're keeping. I think this is a mistake. Duly noted. Dr. Mason Barry, September 14th, 1996, inside the Doth Aral Minor. I think it's about... 5.15 a.m., but I don't want to turn on my watch light. We can see them. I don't think that this is the nest that the locals described, though. There are only four of them here. Everything they say about these creatures is true. The big red eye, the spindly legs. I can't speak to the gray skin or the eyes of redness looking through these goggles, but Dr. Briggs confirmed that earlier. I was expecting the wings to be larger, though. The rigid coverings only seem to go about halfway down the back. We're still at a pretty substantial distance, and even with these binoculars I can't get enough clarity to make out a lot of details, but I don't see a mouth on these creatures. They have two vertical slits just below the eyes, it looks like. I think, I think these are nostrils of some kind, which is leading me to doubt that these creatures are any kind of arachnid or insect. And Actually, hey, Bill, does that look like a tail to you? Where? The one closest to us. Look carefully. It sort of follows the arch of the back, but it just hangs there. Is that a tail? Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Are these things reptiles? I don't think so. The back curves down, the tail follows it. Lizard spines don't arch like that. I think that these things are mammals. They look hairless. That's not unheard of for subterranean mammals. And it could be short fur, right? Uh, I can't tell at this distance. Okay, you've seen them. Can we go now, please? Yeah, we probably should. Marson is going to want to see these things for himself anyways. Ah, oh, shit. This is Dr. Mason Perry, September 14th, 5.43 a.m. We've retraced our steps back to the area where we first observed the rocktail lizard in action, and something's wrong. We followed the line up about 300 feet and saw that it led us to a shallow pool of water. We could easily cross it, but none of us could remember crossing any water. Everything past this point feels extremely unfamiliar to us. This is what he does. This is what he does. This is what he does. This is how he punishes trespassers. This is what he does. Jeanette is taking it pretty hard. This is what they said. They said that the Vandal imprisons people in these caves. Did you listen? This is what he does. He's getting us lost, trying to confuse us. Trying to draw us deeper. His children have seen us. They know that we're here and we gave them time. We gave them time to retie our line to a new path that leads further into the cave. Calm down, Janet. There's no cave demon trying to get us, okay? This is what he does! I wanted to turn back. I wanted to turn back. And now we're dead! You wanted to do your fucking research and now we're all dead. We're going to follow the line. Janet doesn't want to, but she's more afraid of staying here alone. It's possible that falling rocks or rising water have changed the terrain so that we don't realize it. If we get to the end of the line and it turns out it's just something did bite through it, 
at least we'll know. The way I figure, it will be dawn soon. Daylight should be an easy enough source to follow to an exit if worse comes to worse. What the hell are these things? We've been following the line for about an hour, and about twenty minutes ago we saw two more of them. They were standing rear to rear with their hindquarters touching and lurching back and forth into each other, grunting and buzzing with their eyes wide open and fixed on nothing. It looked like they were mating. I know insects will sometimes breed end to end like this, so now I'm doubting my suspicions that they were mammalian. I don't believe they saw us, but we've turned off the headlamps just in case. We're currently proceeding with night vision from here on in. <sighs> this is, uh, sorry, this is Mason Perry. Dr. Kincaid is gone. He slipped, he, he slipped off an edge and hit his head before falling. I don't know where he went, and I presume he's unconscious. As soon as he fell, Jeanette started running. She says one of the children grabbed his ankle and dragged him down. I want to go back for him, but she refuses, and I don't have the gear or skill necessary to climb down that edge by myself. We're leaving him, I guess. Hopefully we can get someone back here in time to save him. Shit. Dr. Mason Perry, September 14th, 1996, inside the Dorth Arrow Minor, 7.27 a.m. Our line is definitely cut. The line led us directly to the ridge above the nest, so I suspect it was a prank by the young locals. Naturally, Jeanette insists it was the Bandolf's children trying to punish us. What we saw was grotesque. One of the creatures hung off the wall about twenty feet from the ground with its head facing the ceiling. It gave birth like that. Six or seven offspring fell directly down onto the ground. The youngest died on impact, and a few more were killed when several of the adults mauled them. The three that survived only did so by viciously slaughtering their attackers. I saw them feasting on one of the slain corpses, and we ran. At this point, we're exhausted, so we've set up camp. I'm taking first watch whilst Jeanette sleeps, if she's able. I killed one. It came up on the camp, and I shot it. We were wrong about these animals. They're simians. They look disturbingly human. I suspect a heretofore unknown strain of hominid. They have no eyes. They're totally blind. What we thought was an eye was actually a mouth, opening and shutting. They don't have wings either. It, it's a ribcage. The creature looks like a human that walks upside down with its stomach pointing upwards. The mouth appears to be on top of the head because of this inversion. What I thought was a tail was actually the animal's genitals. They're extremely skinny and their legs appear substantially longer than ordinary human legs. They lack much appreciable muscle mass, however, which is odd considering the speed with which they move and their tendency to climb. They have opposable digits on all of their pedal extremities, though it's apparent that the ones that should be feet are underdeveloped. I suspect that the lack of muscle mass is owed to the creature's light weight. There's no way this thing weighs more than 90 pounds. It's definitely hairless, covered completely in translucent white skin. Jeanette freaked out when she saw it, but she calmed down considerably since then. In fact, she's calmer now than she's been since we first saw the creature. It could be that she knows what it is now, but I suspect it has more to do with the knowledge that these children can be killed. She's agreed to take second watch and let me catch a few hours of sleep. This is Jeanette Briggs, daughter of Samuel Briggs, human child of the land of the man-god Christ. I now understand my duty. 
I am going to return to the nest of the children of Bandoth to offer myself as a servant to the Earth God. I shall never escape these caves, so I will willingly make myself a new home in Doth Alanya, his kingdom beneath the earth. I'm leaving this message for Mason Perry that he might join me. Shit! Janet's disappeared. Shit! She left me a message on this machine saying she went back to the nest. Obviously, she's panicking worse than I realized. I, I have to go after her. If I don't make it back, whoever finds this, tell my kids I love them. And get out. Get out now, if you're still in the caves listening to this. Press stop and run. Listen later. Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god. This is Mason Perry. Shit. I don't know what the hell time it is. 9.30 a.m. Jeanette is dead. When I got to the nest, Jeanette was standing in the middle of it, taking off her clothes. The children, they... They watched this. They were in a circle around her, just watching. And Jeanette, she bent over backwards like one of them. And they came at her. Oh, Christ, dude. There were two. One on each end of her, and they were, they started to... They were violating her. And another came up and tried to get on, but the one between her legs wouldn't stop thrusting and get out of the way. So the third one, he grabbed her by the torso and just started pulling. It ripped off these huge chunks of her skin, off her muscle, just ripped her open. And then it went for the hole. And then two more did this on the other side, and then more started ripping holes, and pretty soon, she was just a pile of wet meat. Oh, fucking Christ. I don't... There's nothing left, but... And then they started eating it. She never screamed. She... She didn't make a sound at all. I think that... I think that she wanted to die. It's been two weeks since I came into these godforsaken caves. I've long since run out of food and my best efforts to catch rocktail lizards have netted me nothing but injuries. I've used the first aid kit in the pack to disinfect them and bandage them up best I can, but I'm concerned about my ability to treat further injuries. I found some water, which looked clear enough to supplement my water supply. Hopefully the rocks have done a passable job filtering it. I've seen several of the children since Jeanette's death, but they don't come near me. I think it's the corpse of their own in my campsite that scares them off. I have a theory about the phylogeny of these creatures. I think that they were once a group of early hominids who were trapped inside these caves when a rock slide closed in the cave's mouth. I think they clung to the ceilings as much as possible to stay away from the rock lizards, or perhaps to get the drop on it when they were hungry. I suspect they developed their upside-down hang to give them a better visibility of the tiny lizards on the cave floor and to help them see the oncoming rocks. Over time, their bodies changed to accommodate this lifestyle, until they were a formidable enough predator to walk on the ground again. When outside of the nest, they seemed to come down to the cave floors only to mate. By the time the rocks were finally cleared away from the mouth of the cave, they had become so dependent on the cave's darkness that they never ventured outside. I'm out of options. I need food. I'm, I'm going to eat what meat I can salvage from the carcass at my campsite. Hopefully it will give me enough strength to try and climb them out. I suspect... 
<coughs> I think it's been a week since I ate from the carcass. I, I didn't get any immediate indigestions or signs of food poisoning, but since yesterday I felt very ill. Lately I've come to wonder whether Jeanette was right about the children. At first I thought they might be primitive hominids, but I can't explain the guide wire. How could they have been smart enough to know to cut through our line and lead us to their nest? I don't think that was a prank anymore. I don't think anyone who knew the story of these creatures would attempt to strand another human being in this dark hell. I thought that the children might have cut the line out of curiosity and carried it with them as far as they could to the nest, but today I realized it had been tied up at the campsite. How would they know to knot it in that way? I think they were intentionally trying to trick us. Is the thing that a Nitchin called the Bandorth responsible? Is there some superior intelligence or power guiding these creatures? And, and does it build its army of children from humans it traps in these caves? Are the children of Bandorth's ancient hominids or disfigured humans? I can barely separate fact from fantasy in my mind. My watch slipped off my wrist two days ago and shattered. I've lost all sense of time in the interregnum. I'm losing weight too quickly and I expect, I expect to die soon. My eyes feel gummy and infected. Yesterday I, I decided to start a fire to cook some of the carcass. I couldn't risk further infection, and no other foods has been available. There was no wood, so I burned some of my clothes. Once I had eaten all the meat on the carcass, I realized I lost the only thing keeping the children away from my camp. I tried to keep the fire going through the night in hopes that it would scare them away. I'm naked now, and the fire's gone. I considered trying to burn anything in this dictaphone that seemed flammable, but I've since thought better of it. I'll be tying this recorder to the guideline in hopes that any rescue attempts might find it. Though given how long I've waited, I doubt anyone is coming. Oh, my back is killing me. The tape ends there. According to testimony by Dr. Enciada, the rescuers spotted several of the creatures mentioned in the tapes during their second trip into the caves. On the fourth trip, when this tape was found, they opened fire on one which approached their party, scaring it away. They described this last creature as stouter than the others, and with what appeared to be bandages wrapped around its arms.